Good afternoon. What I want to do today is go through an introduction to the convolution integral and simply explain the pieces that make that up and how you might start to become a little bit more comfortable with this intimidating object that we've called the convolution integral or that is called. We haven't called it that, but it's been called that. Let's then try to see how we can interpret this. So let me first learn how to spell. And now we have interpretation. What I want to do is view x of t as an input We'll view h of t as an impulse response from a linear time invariant system. So h of t is an impulse response of a linear time invariant system. And y of t is the resulting output of this system. As a picture of that, we have, we can view a system which we're now describing by its impulse response, h of t. We have an input that's applied to that which we're calling x of t. And that input, when applied to a system that has an impulse response h of t, will produce a particular output response y of t. This picture, block diagram picture, is a time domain picture. And I want you to be very clear that that's different from what you're used to seeing in a block diagram for the frequency domain. We are not saying in this block diagram that h of t is equal to the product of h of t and x of t. That's not the case in the time domain. We know that based on what we started with in terms of our premise, we're trying to understand this convolution integral and this is how our impulse response and our input combine to form the output response y of t. And you're probably thinking, well, that doesn't look like what I'm used to. Well, what you're used to maybe when you start looking at block diagrams is this frequency domain concept where we now have pictorially it looks very similar except now be careful with what we're using in this picture. Now we are using frequency domain objects. The Laplace transformed input which we're calling capital X of S. The transfer function of our system which happens to be the Laplace transform of the impulse response, but the transfer function then is h of s. Our output is capital Y of s, which in the frequency domain is the product of h of s and x of s. And that's one of the reasons why everyone likes the frequency domain, is now we're simply playing with multiplication operations. Let's now go back to the time domain and let's suppose that our system produces a impulse response and I'm just going to sketch one so that we have a concept to think about or a picture to visualize. Suppose that our system now produces, and we're now using, a, or we're assuming that we have a linear time invariant system. 
Suppose this system produces an impulse response that looks like maybe an exponential decay. And that was supposed to be of amplitude A. Let's just say that that's now A e to the minus alpha t, which decays with as a function of time. And this is our impulse response, or how the system actually behaves when we hit the system with an impulse. Pictorially, again, with a block diagram, what that says is if this is our system, and we put, put into that system a particular input, and in particular that input is the impulse, then our system is going to generate an output, y of t, which is actually h of t, and that's where this impulse response wording comes from. Now what we want to do is use that information or that data concerning the system. We know it generates now a particular impulse response. We can now use that and see how the system will respond, what y of t will be when we apply a generic input x of t to our system. Again, to give us something to think about or visualize, let's just say that we have something like that for our system. Let's label these points so that we have specific time instances to think about, and here is our generic input x of t. To get us started, what we want to do is try to determine, based on this input that's now applied to our system that has an exponentially decaying impulse response, what will y of t look like? Let me just make a comment or a note, and this will make a little more sense after you've played with this a while, but the closer that h of t, the impulse response of our system, the closer that behaves like an ideal impulse, and we know what that looks like, that's just this infinitely tall, has an area underneath it of one occurrence at the origin, the closer our system's impulse response looks like or behaves like an ideal impulse, the closer our output response y of t, the closer that will look like x of t. That's just something to keep in mind as we're thinking about what's going on. Let's now go back to our input x of t and say, okay, if this is the signal that we are going to apply to our system and our system behaves like this, h of t, when we hit the system with an impulse, how is it going to behave when we hit it with this signal? And in particular, which of these points that are labeled on x of t will be applied to the system h of t first in time? That's the first thing we want to think about. Or which part of x of t is applied to the system first. I hope by looking at that you can see that this is the point in time and the shape of x of t that's going to hit the system first. That's occurring sooner in time. And for that reason then, our answer to this question would be, well, that's just t sub 1. What about the next unique featured part of x of t? will hit 
the system next. Next featured part of x of t to hit h of t. I hope you're starting to see that that's now t, what we labeled t sub 2, and that pattern just continues. Then t sub 3, then t sub 4. And that's important. If we think about that in terms of a picture, we can say thus x of t is applied to our system, which we're cataloging as h of t in a manner of first t1, then t2, then t3, and finally t4. Those points or transition points on x of t are applied in that time sequence to the system h of t. Now, if we want those points, of our input x of t to actually hit h of t or be applied to the system h of t in the correct time sequence then maybe we should be thinking about our x of t sort of rotated or flipped in time. Maybe we should what I'll call flip x of t in time when we are actually computing or when we compute the output y of t. Meaning, if somebody now wanted to sketch a picture of that, what we have is something that looks more like this. Now for what is getting applied as we move this x of t into our system h of t. And now we are going to use a new variable, lambda, just because that's going to allow us to do the integration that we need to as we move through this process of computing the convolution integral. But now what this depicts is actually a flipped x or input waveform in the independent variable, which we've now called lambda. So this is now x of minus lambda, and this waveform is needed in the computation of the output y of t. Now after t1 is applied to our system, h of 1, so now after T1 is initially applied, to the system, it will continue that T1 value, it will influence So now after T1 is initially applied to the system, its influence will be weighted by the way our impulse response
responds after its initial reaction. In picture form, what that's saying is this is what our system does if we hit it with an impulse. And now what we're doing is we're hitting it with a slightly different signal. This is now our T1 that's now coming through. And we now want to see, and this is now at the point in time that we have shown T1's influence on the system is weighted by this particular amount and this new value of X of T is getting weighted by that amount. This point in X of T is getting weighted by that amount in the impulse response waveform. This blue curve is our H of lambda and this one was our X of minus lambda, but I hope now it looks like, wait a minute, we're now moving that around. It wasn't at the point minus lambda any longer. We've now slid it to the right. So what we need to do with respect to this waveform is now we need to slide the X of minus lambda waveform through our impulse response waveform H of lambda. What that's saying is we actually need what I've just labeled and that is T minus lambda where T is now adjustable and we use that T to slide our input signal through the impulse when we need new values or subsequent values of our output y of t. Or to obtain the output y of t at a particular time, which is what's shown in the earlier diagram, we actually need to add up or sum or integrate all of the portions of x of t minus lambda and h of lambda their point-by-point point product and sum up those particular products that have been active up to the point in time in question which we've called T up to this point in time T and that's actually what gives rise to our convolution integral. To get y of t, we now need to sum h of lambda with x of t minus lambda, d lambda. Realize that lambda is our variable of integration. And our t, lambda is the variable of integration, t is actually the time in question when we want to find or evaluate the output at that particular point in time. That's going to conclude this brief introduction to the convolution integral and I hope that helps you a little bit with your understanding of that particular mathematical operation.